blood boiling right off the bat by talking about what we would describe as the Washington consensus, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the view in Washington about nuclear weapons in general. And I'm sorry to tell you, as if you don't already know, the general consensus is that nuclear weapons are, are, are relics of a bygone era in many ways, right? Very specifically, for the U.S., and our allies, nuclear weapons are kind of unnecessary, using nuclear weapons in particular, because of our conventional superiority, right? We, and there was a, in the past, we loved nuclear weapons. We needed them, which I'll say more about in a second. But today, we don't need them, which is one of the reasons why we can go around the world saying that others don't need them. But for us, they're unnecessary. For our, adver for our potential adversaries, nuclear weapons use is just irrational, given U.S. nuclear and conventional, for that matter, retaliatory capabilities. You know, the, the common saying in Washington is who would be crazy enough to use nuclear weapons against Uncle Sam? We've got thousands uh, uh, of nuclear weapons, oh, less than thousands, uh, depending on how you're counting these days. So given that basic view, the nuclear dangers out there lie elsewhere, not in traditional interstate uh, nuclear deterrence uh, arena, but it get people thinking about irrational leaders. Is Kim Jong-un Kim Jong you know, irrational? Would uh, an Iranian nuclear-armed Iran be uh, um, so fanatical as to use them? Uh, terrorists, of course, nuclear security issues, um, and accidents even. Those are the dangers that take priority in debates and discussions in, in Washington these days. And that has some important implications. Uh, uh, the first, of course, is that deterrence issues, interstate deterrence issues, are uh, being ignored. Um, the problem of escalation that we'll talk about today, escalation in the midst of a conventional war, is really not appreciated, not understood flat out, in many cases not appreciated enough in others. Because of that, nuclear modernization is often seen as a luxury that we just can't afford in these times. And U.S. nuclear policy, at least, boils down to non-proliferation, arms control, nuclear security. Again, not interstate nuclear deterrence issues. Our argument is that this is dangerously mistaken, the conventional wisdom in Washington and elsewhere, and that the greatest international security danger of the 21st century will be deterring U.S. and other adversaries from uh, uh, escalating to the nuclear level for adopting coercive nuclear escalation in the midst of a conventional conflict. And what we want to emphasize here is the rationality of this strategy, which is often not appreciated. This is not crazy delusional leaders resorting to nukes because they're crazy. This is a rational strategy, and we want to walk through that logic. And this is important to do now, not in the midst of a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, which is going to unfold very quickly, not in the midst of air-sea battle against China or any other uh, conflict. For the United States in particular, it's important to understand these dynamics now. We need to think about what kinds of capabilities we would want to deter, and if deterrence fails, to mitigate that kind of escalatory strategy. And in the end, I, we are going to stress that the United States and other planners need to think hard about how to trade off military effectiveness against the escalation risks. If we're facing these major escalation risks in these wars, how do we fight them in a way that might not initiate nuclear escalation right off the bat? So let me first talk about the nature of the problem. I'll, I'll go through a few slides and then hand, hand things over to Daryl for the second half of the talk. The, the nature of the problem begins uh, with the fact that the United States has extensive alliance commitments around the world. Right? And it's also the case that our closest allies face either nuclear armed adversaries or potential nuclear armed adversaries. We also have the fact that the United States fights a lot of wars. Right? When the Cold War ended and there was a lot of talk about the peace on earth that would break out, um, you know, the last decade and a half of have undermined, a couple decades have undermined that guy. We're getting old, aren't we? Um, we fought six major combat operations since 1990 alone. Uncle Sam fights wars uh, quite often. And because of this, because of our extensive alliance commitments and because of our track record, it's reasonable to assume or to predict that a military clash against a nuclear-armed adversary 
is a distinct possibility. The most common flashpoint that people point to is the Korean Peninsula against nuclear-armed North Korea. Perhaps this also involves China and, and the uh, disputes over in East Asia. Um, and in the future, Pakistan, Iran, Russia increasingly. I just returned from a trip to Europe where uh, uh, many more people are concerned about a, the Russian nuclear arsenal than they are about any potential Iranian one. The next step in a, analyzing the problem is to understand that the United States and our allies enjoy massive conventional military superiority, okay? We strongly prefer to keep our wars conventional. We would prefer to fight our wars at the conventional level because we will win our wars at the conventional level. And we can get into debates about how long U.S. conventional superiority is going to last. But when you look out at the world today and you think about any conflict dyad, any potential U.S. adversary, the United States is going to win and win quickly uh, uh, in terms of traditional military operations at the conventional level. But our adversaries know this as well. And our adversaries have to find a way to forestall defeat. And nuclear weapons, often said the weapons of the weak, they're a powerful stalemating tool. And this is not some abstract logic about the stalemating capability of nuclear weapons. The logic should be to fam familiar to anyone who was alive during the Cold War, who has studied the Cold War. This was U.S. NATO policy in the Cold War. The strategy of coercive nuclear escalation that we're talking about was U.S. policy. Right? If the Soviet Union had invaded Western Europe, come pouring across the North German plain or through the Fulda Gap in West Germany, the United States and its allies were going to use nuclear weapons. Right? This was the only plan on the, on, the, on the shelf. We built the forces, we trained the forces, we distributed nuclear weapons all over Western Europe. And our objective, especially in the uh, uh, not in the immediate beginning of the Cold War, but as we, uh, as we went further along, was not to nuke Moscow right off the bat, but to use nuclear weapons in a coercive way, right, to build those weapons, to use them in a coercive way to deter the invasion in the first place, and if the invasion happened, to coerce a halt to that conflict before we escalated to general all-out nuclear war. The point we want to emphasize is that the dynamics are the same today. The only thing that's changed uh, are, the, are the places at the table. Now, the United States and its allies are the conventionally strong power, and it's our adversaries who face conventional inferiority. And for that reason, the reason we were reached for nukes should apply the same to our adversaries today. Now, this still seems a little crazy. Why would an adversary reach for nuclear weapons in this context, why would adversaries risk nuclear escalation? There are actually three different pathways to this danger. The first is that if we do what we've done in Iraq in 2003 and before, if we pursue regime change, our, the adversary faces a life and death incentive to coerce a halt to the conflict. Okay, there's the ace in the hole, the only alternative they have then to lose power. If we decide instead to take regime change off the table. We appreciate that. We're not going to go to Pyongyang. We're not going to go to another Baghdad. We're going to pursue more limited aims. The regime may still fall. The, a quick example would be on the Korean Peninsula, if we decide that if a war breaks out, we and our South Korean allies, the Combined Forces Command, we're not going to go all the way to Pyongyang. We don't want to threaten the regime. We're afraid they might use nuclear weapons. Instead, what we'll do is crush Kim's military. Maybe we'll go 25 kilometers north of, uh, of the DMZ to take out the artillery threat, and we'll stop there. The problem there is that that outcome may not be, uh, uh, in Kim's mind, a regime surviving outcome. That may spell the end of his regime, and we simply may not understand that, in which case coercive nuclear escalation is an alternative. And third, even if we adopt limited aims that truly would not be threatening to the regime, the way that we fight our wars is inherently escalatory. The way of modern wars, not just the United States, but any sophisticated military is going to fight in a similar fashion. Again, we've seen this movie before several times. In the first days of every war that we fought since the end of the Cold War, we see a similar kind of set of operations. From day one, we're attempting blinding and disabling 
uh, attacks against command and control. Our objective is to deny situational awareness to the adversary. We go after radar sites. We go after air defenses. We go after leadership targets. It makes a lot of sense. Why do we do that? Because it's a great way to fight war in the 21st century. The downside of that is that an adversary who lacks situational awareness may come to the conclusion that it's, life is over for the regime. And you're back to number one, which is their perception that we're pursuing regime change, in which case nuclear weapons are the one tool that they can use to check mighty Uncle Sam. Losing a war to the United States, just in case we forget what happens when you lose a war and regime, you think regime change is not so bad, it is a terrible outcome. We, you know, we could, if we could interview Noriega rotting in prison, he would probably agree. Milosevic is dead. Karadzic's rotting in prison in The Hague. Saddam is dead. Gaddafi's dead. Saddam's brothers are dead. Gaddafi's family's dead. Um, this is the outcome that our adversaries face when you lose a conventional war to the United States. Right? Our regional, what we call limited wars, regional wars are their total wars. And we shouldn't forget that. And the implications, when the United States loses a regional war, Right? This is not the outcome. This is the outcome for the other guy. Let me give a, walk through a scenario. It shows that we chose the Korean Peninsula uh, to lay out the logic, to illustrate the logic of coercive nuclear escalation. The point is not to predict how the war starts. You know, we were just over in, uh, uh, um, in Seoul speaking to U.S. and allied uh, uh, folks about this, and, and I think we were concerned that we would get uh, on a tangent about what, exa what ex actions are exactly going to bring about this conventional conflict. That's not what we want to do here. The goal of the scenario is just to help us understand what considerations might cause an adversary to escalate to the nuclear level. And then, most importantly, where does that leave us? Where does that leave the United States? What options would we have once an adversary has crossed the nuclear threshold? So, assume a crisis with North Korea tomorrow in a couple of years, but assume there's a crisis, assume it leads to conflict, maybe it begins with North Korean shelling of the South, the Combined Forces Command, the U.S. and South Korean forces launch counter-battery operations, um, maybe another South Korean ship is attacked, and again, you hear South Koreans say, if this happens again, we're going to war, operations intensify, and North Korean forces cross the border. If that happens, of course, the U.S and South Korean forces are going to be launching all kinds of air operations, sea attacks, suppression of enemy air defenses, attacks on enemy C4I, follow-on forces, um, and assume that this goes well, the Combined Forces Command is able to uh, halt the North Korean advance and quickly shift over to a counter-offensive, which is likely what would occur and occur very quickly if this uh, unfolds. If North Korea continues to fight, Pyongyang faces a severe dilemma. If they continue to fight, they face inevitable defeat. The North Korean regime is not going to fight and win a conventional war against the U.S. and its South Korean allies. And in that case, the Kim regime is going to face the same fate of Saddam faced and Qaddafi faced. And again, don't, you know, don't take my word for it. They used this example. After Libya fell and Qaddafi was pulled from a culvert, severely beaten, murdered, et cetera, the North Korean you know, official media put out an announcement and said, well, what more reason do you need to see that, you know, that, that why a state needs nuclear weapons? There are two options. First of all, maybe there's some kind of golden parachute on the table, maybe some kind of arrangement where the North Korean regime could flee to uh, a dacha somewhere in China. Uh, you know, it's Kim and his top 60 picks, whoever he wants, um, could survive. But let's assume for now that that option is not um, available. Um, the only other alternative that we see is escalation to the nuclear level to force stalemate. So how would this, what does this actually look like? This is not a, U, a, a North Korean nuclear strike against Los Angeles, even if North Korea had that capability. This is something lower on the spectrum. The spectrum could be anything from a North Korean detonation on its own territory, a test detonation, to a detonation over the Sea of Japan, um, or the um, uh, 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 detonation over a U.S. carrier group, or hitting a Japanese city, or hitting a South Korean city. Here we chose a missile strike against Kadena Air Force Base um, uh, in Japan with a 20 kiloton nuclear weapon. And most importantly, it's the threat of what's to come. The North Korean regime says, halt the conventional war 
now or we will use another dozen weapons on Japanese and South Korean cities. If you continue that march to Pyongyang, that's what we're going to do. If that happens, what does the president, he or she, face in this case, right, in the United States or our allies? The enemy has crossed the nuclear threshold and is threatening to, to nuke a bunch more additional targets, including cities of our allies. We have essentially four options. Maybe you can come up with some more, but I think you know, most options fall into these categories. The first option is to say, you know what, this has gone way too far. Right? We, you know, we, we didn't mind fighting a conventional war. We didn't want a nuclear war. And what we're going to do is accept a ceasefire, basically cave into the demands. We've got you know, lawyers and spin doctors, and we can spin it any way we want. But we'll accept a ceasefire. Let's halt this war before it goes any further. The downside, of course, which you see on the right side here in this column, is that that sets a really troubling precedent, a troubling precedent for those that are most concerned about nonproliferation. The message that you've sent is that anybody who wants to check the United States just needs to use a nuclear weapon, and the job gets done. So adverse, potential adversaries in the future will see the wisdom of acquiring nuclear weapons. And it's even worse than that. Our friends, our allies now, have reason to question the US nuclear umbrella, and we'll see the utility of having nuclear weapons of their own. Second option which sometimes we hear when we present this analysis is, wait, 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 North Korea went nuclear? Okay, we're turning Pyongyang into glass, right? We are going after the North Korean leadership. We're going to set, talk about setting a precedent. We're going to set a precedent that anybody who uses nuclear weapons is going to suffer, I don't know, is there even a worse fate than death? Um, we're going to go after the North Korean leadership. This is not about killing Korean people, but we're going after the leadership. The downside of this, and, and march on Pyongyang, we'll continue the march on Pyongyang, we'll wait till, you know, things, the radiation levels, you know, are reduced. But eventually, we're going to own the peninsula. Maybe we'll rely on missile defense. If we're nuking Pyongyang, we might expect them to use nuclear weapons against our allies. We'll, hopefully, missile defense will help alleviate that problem. Uh, the problem with this strategy, of course, is that those leadership targets are located in major population centers. So we're going to be killing millions of Korean people. And secondly, it may not do anything to address the risk of future nuclear strikes. If Kim has delegated authority, if commanders have permission to use nuclear weapons, they follow through on those orders, um, we risk several more hits on, uh, uh, on allied territory. A third option, which we, again, we sometimes hear this, probably the least option I, th I venture to say we've heard um, less than the others, is that you just ignore the escalation. You continue the march on uh, 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 Pyongyang. You rely on missile defense. Maybe this is the arms control community. Our friends in the arms control community sometimes say, look, what a, this is a great example to not resort to nuclear weapons. The adversary did it. Doesn't mean that we have to do it. And if we can fight and win this war, then we will have set a terrific precedent that nuclear use doesn't, you know, doesn't solve things, doesn't pull your chestnuts out of the fire. The big downside of this, of course, you're doing nothing to address the danger of additional nuclear hits on allied territory. And because of that, you are risking permanent damage to um, uh, the global alliance network. Not to mention your own forces. Not to mention your own forces, of course. The fourth option, which may help deal with the additional threat, of course, is a counter force strike. Going after the North Korean nuclear delivery systems, warheads, weapons, Wherever we, whatever we know, wherever we can find them. Yeah, we're still going to rely on missile defense. We're still continuing the march on Pyongyang. But we have to go after the threat, and the threat is embodied in those weapons. The downside here, of course, we may not destroy them all. And the problem with counterforce is that if you don't destroy the other guy's nuclear arsenal completely, the odds of that arsenal being used against you, you know, are quite high. I mean, they may have already been high anyways, but you know, you certainly, if you're hoping to, uh, um, for restraint, that's probably out the window at that point. And equally important, if it's a nuclear strike, using nuclear weapons against nuclear weapons, then we risk killing, again, millions of uh, non-combatants. So this is not a pretty picture. This is, we used to call this slide, I think, four grim options, and I think very much that's where we stand. Let me ha hand things off to to Daryl to talk about the um, additional implications. Okay, thanks.
Well, I always feel so depressed listening to the first half of this briefing. It makes me imagine how you guys feel. Um, as Kier said, we gave um, this briefing to a handful of audiences in, in um, South Korea recently. And after one of these, um, a fairly senior South Korean said, that does in fact seem grim. That does put your country and mine in a very difficult situation. But there's one mistake that you made. And we said, we said please tell us. And he backed us up a few slides and he said, that is not the Sea of Japan, that is the East Sea. <laughs> so I notice we haven't changed that yet. I think we're just going to take all the markings you know, off of, of the names of maybe every country off of there just to avoid distracting. As Keir said, um, all these options are lousy in different ways. But that shouldn't be surprising, which is that's why nuclear weapons, that's why escalation is a useful strategy. That's fundamentally why we think of and have thought of for decades as nuclear weapons as a very useful stalemating weapon for the weak. As Keir said, when NATO expected that it would have difficulty defending itself conventionally in the context of a, of a big war in Europe and the Cold War, that's why nuclear weapons were valuable to NATO because the Soviets, in that case, didn't have a good response option. Just like none of these four options here is a very good response option for the United States and South Korea. I'm sure we can kill lots of people in Pyongyang, number two, but that risks lots of nuclear attacks. It doesn't solve the problem. The vulnerability of South Korean and Japanese cities to nuclear response. We could kill lots of millions of people. That doesn't solve the problem. They can still do it. Number four is maybe the, the logic, in some ways, the logical response, but you might not get them all. You likely will not get them all. So all these options stink. That's, but that's why nuclear weapons are useful stalemating devices. When we look at this, though, there are three remaining questions, which is number one is, well, that sh sounds worrying, but you know, we could make PowerPoint slides you, the folks in this room especially, on 20 different worrying things having nothing to do with this that we could all, you know, commit, ruin your day. Asteroid strikes, you know, uh, smallpox getting out of labs, uh, you name it. We can, we can make PowerPoint slides of scary things. The question is just because there are scary things that are tough to solve doesn't mean it should be a focus of national attention and especially if it has big budgetary consequences. So the question is, is is this really how real leaders in the real world actually think? Or is this just kind of a scary set of PowerPoint slides? Number one. Number two is perhaps it's a, a, a difficult dilemma, but maybe our nuclear arsenal is moving in the right direction given these, these threats. Um, I was expecting in this audience there might be chuckles on that number two, but we'll see in a second. And then number three is, well, maybe we're thinking about this question pretty carefully at the level of conventional war planning. Because again, what Keir was talking about was about the linkages between U.S. conventional operations or U.S. allied conventional operations and adversary incentives to escalate. So maybe we have a pretty good handle on this problem from the standpoint of conventional operations and planning. So let's go through these one at a time. So first of all, do countries actually think of this way? Again, if, if you and you, you might do this, but if you talk to people in Washington about nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence, the thing we keep telling ourselves over and over again, the thing that people in Washington is, is these are weapons of the past. Nobody with a right mind is going to use these weapons. These are weapons that don't serve modern purposes. And the amazing thing is, is you actually don't need this presentation that we made you sit through. If you just listen to what others are saying on the other side, they say, you're wrong. Which is actually, if you look at the declaratory nuclear policies of other countries, including the folks, well, it's specifically countries who have nuclear weapons and yet face military con inferiority, conventional inferiority over conflicts that they are deeply concerned about, the vast majority of them are telling you they are planning exactly this. You don't have to take our, our, our word for this. So the Pakistanis say openly, this is one of the principal purposes of our nuclear arsenal, our, us Pakistan. They say, we intend to use nuclear weapons as a way of stalemating Indian conventional forces if they invade Pakistan. We don't have to read tea leaves. You don't even have to speak you know, local languages. Um, Russia today um, is, is specifically justifies and explains our nuclear arsenal by talking about at, uh, neighbors of, this, of, of Russia who have superior conventional forces and the utility of aspects of the Russian nuclear arsenal for countering conventional defeat. And this is what they're saying. And we're like, nobody would, would use these. These don't serve con you know, modern conventional problems. Um, North Korea doesn't speak as often, but there was a document. We haven't got our hands on it. it was, um, again, a, st a striking document produced, I guess, about a year ago in North Korea that basically talked about the employment of North Korean nuclear weapons in a variety, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an escalatory fashion for the purpose of stalemating CFC 
conventional forces and conventional operations. What, you know, Israel, I don't think there's very much about Israeli nuclear doctrine, but again, I'd bet my car, if not my house, actually I might even bet my house on this one, that one of the key attributes of kind of Israeli concepts of the utilization of nuclear weapons has to do with, among other scenarios, a scenario where they suffer an unexpected major conventional defeat to one of their neighbor states as a way of coercing a quick end to the conflict. So again, the Washington conversation is these are weapons to solve a problem that no longer exists, not 21st century weapons, but everybody else is saying, no, you're wrong, we intend to use these to pull our chestnuts out of the fire. And so it's a real disjuncture in the talk about this. The one question mark in here is China, which is, again, a country who is in a situation where it could lose badly conventional wars, and yet doesn't openly talk about these weapons this way. Hypothesis one is China's just different in their thinking. That happens. Hypothesis two is they're not being completely open with the way they think about these things. I don't know which is correct. OK. So it's a bad problem. That's unfortunate. I mean, it's good for people, I guess, working for the weapons labs, but it's bad for the, bad for the rest of us. Um, but maybe we've got this kind of handled. Maybe the arsenal's already moving in the right direction. And so you'd say, well, what is the right direction? So obviously, there are lots of different nuclear missions. Even in the United States, where the role of nuclear weapons in the US national security strategy is diminishing, there's still multiple uses of nuclear weapons in terms of you know, deterring strategic attack on the United States of America or other attacks of mass effect on the United States of America. But what are the kinds of attributes in the force that would be useful if you were facing these sorts of circumstances. And typically when we talk through people and, and in some different environments, we kind of bring people into the conversation, we could do it later, and talk through how much you dislike different options on this. And it usually becomes a, a conversation about which of these options is least bad. And often people end up kind of getting rid of numbers two and three, because at the end of the day, if you're not doing anything to protect Japanese and, and Korean cities, it's a pretty terrible option. And so they go back and forth between finding some way to make number one politically acceptable, is there some sort of way of getting yourself out of this thing, or number four, finding some way of defending yourself from subsequent attacks through number four. And oftentimes their, their attractiveness of going to one depends on how attractive they think the capabilities are for four. If you think you can do a pretty good um, counterforce operation, then maybe that's the right op option. If you can't, then maybe it means you have to find some acceptable way to go to, to do number one or something like that. So the question is, what are the attributes in the force that would give you a better versus worse counterforce capability? And at least when you're thinking about the nuclear component of this, I, I think three attributes of, of, of weapon systems seem to kind of jump right out. One is promptness. So if to the extent you're trying to destroy um, North Korean delivery systems, um, or weapons and storage bunkers before they're used, obviously the length of time between when you locate a specific target and when a weapon arrives on that target is really important. And maybe you want to get a lot less than 30 minutes. Number two is accuracy. Um, and number three is, is yield. Now, some people who are less um, knowledgeable about these topics than this audience say, well, why, why does it matter what the yield is? A nuke is a nuke. The consequences are giant, et cetera. You shouldn't be worried about yield. Again, here the chuckles, um, people here, I think many of you guys know, that's not the case. There are vast differences in terms of consequences. So one illustration of kind of the differences um, is we did, we did a little modeling using um, HPAC, I don't, um, which is a Department of Energy and Department of Defense piece of software that tracks fallout plumes. And we asked, um, we, we obviously it's all open source, and so we don't know where hardened targets are that might be nuclear storage sites or particularly interesting. Um, bunkers that might be associated with the right t um, mobile launchers in North Korea. So we just picked five locations. You can see them better on the right side because it's kind of obscured by the fallout plumes on the left. But we picked five locations just around the compass signs of, of North Korea. And so to imagine a counterforce strike was aimed at a handful of, of sites which we believe, which the United States at that time believed were associated with North Korean nuclear delivery systems. What are the consequences of attacking those sites either with kind of a run-of-the-mill U.S. nuclear strike using high-yield weapons, which might be a two-on-one attack against five targets using the highest, again, according to open sources, the highest yield ballistic missile weapon in the, in the U.S. arsenal, so the W-88 off a Trident II weapon. What's the consequence of doing it that way versus with the lowest yield existing weapon in the U.S. force? So this is not a new weapon. So this was modeled on a, a low-yield version of a B-83, which could be delivered, let's say, by a B-2 or by a tactical aircraft in the region. The answer is a nuke does not equal a nuke, which is, and these were both picked with altitudes appropriate to destroy hardened targets. But the problem was, um, was there's, there's there's, it's difficult to employ high yield weapons low enough to do a lot of damage to hardened targets, but high enough to avoid fallout. 
And so if you do it with a high yield weapon, you cause substantial fallout in the region. We presented this in uh, different audiences react to that left half differently. We presented this to some um, uh, allied audiences who were rather, you know, before they thought the problem was how do you get convinced that the United States will actually be credible and use nuclear weapons? Maybe that suggests the second problem is, dear God, what if the United States does? We presented this to a, a PACOM audience where the response of one of the planners was, damn, that fallout plume totally shuts down my air war plan. And our response was, we, we, at least it occurred to us, that might not be the biggest co you know, consequence of that left strike. But again, you're, you're talking about millions of fatalities. Whereas, you know, you know, again, if you have target location intelligence, low yield weapons give you a very different effect. So the, our point is, is yield, if you're thinking about what attributes in the force might make it better from a counterforce standpoint, yield matters. If you're going to have low yield, then so the accuracy becomes a real, a, real, a real primary thing. So then you ask yourself, is the arsenal moving in the right direction? And typically what you hear about the U.S. arsenal is we have plenty of capabilities. The question is, which ones do we need to retain as we shrink the force? Actually, we'd argue is, is we don't actually have the, the right capabilities even today for these kinds of scenarios, which is, do we have things that are prompt? Yes. Do we have things that are low yield? Yes. Do we have things that are accurate? Yes. Do we have things that marry those three char characteristics? It doesn't appear so, at least in the open source. Now, whether there have been things that have been done to shape or massage, I can't remember the word, a ballistic missile, you know, words, I don't know. Don't tell me if you do. But at least in the open source, it doesn't seem like, like we have things that marry all three of those things. Okay, so the arsenal might be going the wrong direction in some respects. Um, and some of the things that would be most useful might be on the chopping, worried or on the chopping block. Last thing is maybe conventional planners have this, or maybe this has been you know, well kind of understood at the level of conventional planners. And that's what Kier and I have been focusing on for the last, um, last I guess, year or so, talking to conventional war planners in, in Hawaii, in, in South Korea, um, elsewhere. And I, I, I think the view is changing in a positive direction among U.S. conventional war planners. But when, especially when, even 18 months ago when we started talking to them about this, the principal reaction was basically, this isn't our problem. We're conventional war planners. Um, they, the folks we talked to with, again, a, I think a growing exception among the China conventional planners and PACOM who I think think about this increasingly. But in general, conventional war planners say, we, we fight the conventional fight. That's our job. That's a difficult enough job to worry about nuclear escalation. We um, interviewed folks who, again, were, had their hands dirty with various operations plans. And, and we, said, we said, to what extent does target selection in, these plan, in the plans you work on, is it done with the purpose of avoiding escalation? And they kind of laughed. They said, avoid escalation. We don't know how you do that. Like, where do you put a 500-pound bomb for the purpose of escalation control? And they'd say, well, I pick targets with two goals, kill red, protect blue, et cetera. We talked about, well, are targets taken off the list for the purpose of escalation um, control? They said, no. They talked about targets being taken off target lists for other reasons. Cultural sensitivity reasons, yes. Try to avoid the Chinese embassy, yes. Try to avoid things which you don't want to attack for political reasons, but in terms of escalation control causing withholds, it's very limited. Again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a function of the stovepipe nature of the U.S. military. There are nuclear war planners, there are conventional planners, and that's still a big problem. Um, beyond these things, in the Korean context and elsewhere, allies get a vote too. And even though I think the U.S. forces Korea sees this now as a, not because of Kira me, because they understand this, they see this as a growing problem, the South Koreans view things very, very differently. And they basically view the next Korean War as the last Korean War, et cetera. Okay, what can planners do going forward? And I'll show just a couple more slides and we'll stop. So from the conventional war plan standpoint, there's no simple answer. <laughs> All options are, I'd say, problematic. But you might want to think about, or conventional planners might want to think about this as having um, two kind of, uh, um, ex extreme is the wrong words, two kind of options for, for the conventional war at different ends of the spectrum. So one is, and here we use the Korean, the Korean context, I think it's the easiest to talk about in this. So one is, you fight your conventional wars. We don't want a conventional war on the Korean Peninsula. But if it happens, how do you fight the conventional war on the Korean Peninsula? To win. That all, this is one view. That, that the way you minimize civilian consequences, 
Allied consequences, U.S. consequences, is by winning the conventional war as decisively and quickly as possible. And so what that basically says is the end state should be regime elimination because probably that regime is going to fall anyway if there's another big conventional war. So we should aim at that as quickly and rapidly as possible. That therefore ground operations should be aimed in, in CFC plans to quickly repel the attack and rapidly transition over to a counteroffensive. What should be the targets of U.S. And, and South Korean air and missile attacks? The answer is everything. L meaning leadership. Leadership from day one, from hour one, preferably from hour minus five. Leadership, command and control, um, NBC nuclear biological chemical, um, destroy the, the North Korean integrated air defense system. Um, yes, yeah, sure, we'll do some um, uh, co uh, combat air support um, uh, for the, the local fight and battlefield air interdiction. Um, diplomacy, as rapidly as this thing starts, the aim of U.S. messaging and diplomacy has to be to try to get this golden parachute on the table that Kira talked about. Try to convince the North Korean regime, try to convince the Chinese to offer them a golden parachute to Kim in as wide a network as possible. And try the message for the North Korean regime should be, your regime is over. But you senior and mid-level North Koreans who might be in positions to either implement or not nuclear plans, you have a choice to make. And your decisions now will have a big effect, a big decision on whether you survive or not individually and whether your family survives. So this is kind of a, a, the extreme version. Extreme is the wrong way. It's the, it's the one side of the continuum for the most decisive. Most restrained, which is to say um, end state will not be to seek the end of the North Korean regime. That perhaps the end state should be to get a little bit north at the end of the war to control the artillery sites that threaten Seoul and then avoid escalation because we don't want it going down this route. Um, ground operations, quickly repel the attacks, go maybe 20, 25 kilometers north and stop. What, what about air and missile strikes? The answer is you can't do a lot of those things on the left. And this is the, this is the key thing, which is if the entire strategy for avoiding escalation is by convincing the North Korean regime that they're not going to end up like Saddam and Gaddafi, if the strategy in this right column is to convince them that they have a future if they don't escalate, then you presumably can't be attacking leadership sites. You presumably don't want to be attacking nuclear sites. Because if that's their trump card that is keeping us back, and the first six hours of the air war we're launching 200 F-16 strikes at those targets, they don't have to be geniuses to know once we eliminate them, we can go to Pyongyang. So you probably have to have a highly restrained air and missile campaign probably still want to get the Chinese to prepare a golden parachute. And then here the messaging is the opposite, is you're trying to message a regime that says, you do have a future if you restrain yourself. But if you don't, then we're going to Pyongyang. All right. The obvious fact here is there are trade-offs here. There are trade-offs between effectiveness and escalation risks. The left strategy is going to be way more effective than the right, but the left one basically forces them down the path that Kier describes. It forces them to use nuclear weapons. And we should just be real clear that Column on the right, it might not work from an escalation control standpoint, which is, first of all, the South Koreans might have their own war plan. They might be going north. Second of all, is the North Korean government, more than us, might know. Somebody was talking about the Malcolm Gladwell, what, what the dog saw, was that the name of it? This, from the North Korean standpoint, even if we're being highly restrained, they might know that, that if they, we don't stop immediately, 25 kilometers is too far. They're going to fall. And so this might not succeed in preventing escalation, but there's a trade-off here. But in a way, the most important message, I think, from the standpoint of a conventional war planner is the following, is, is, kind of, is blundering into a conventional strategy that is a mixture of the two might be the absolute worst of all options, and it might be where we are today. Namely, if a president in the Oval Office is briefed that he has a conventional option that he and the, and the leaders of South Korea have agreed upon for waging this conventional war. And if that's what the president authorizes, I want a limited conventional option, only 20 kilometers north, escalation control is my, my goal. And, and he or she, the president, signs off on that. But they don't know that that limited option still involves, within the first four to six hours, 250 F-16 strikes against the North Korean leadership and their NBC targets then we might be leaning into or even forcing adversary nuclear escalation when the goal was to stop, was to prevent it, and creating kind of strategic political incoherence. You might say, well, that sounds scary, but that's never going to happen. This is, in a way, what we did in 1991. So in 1991 with Saddam, the entirety of our strategy was a limited offensive to push Iraq out of Kuwait. And we explicitly told them, James Baker told Tariq Aziz, 
we are not going for regime change, and we expect you not to use your chem or bio weapons. That was the war when they actually had them. So we have to kind of think back. And, but, but there was an explicit, there was an explicit deal to make that. We said, we're not going to Baghdad, but you better not use chem or bio weapons. So we had a coherent limited war strategy. What was the air campaign aimed at? Counter leadership, counter WMD. So the point is, and again, we don't have access to the CFC war plans at the unclassified level, but I just say this, folks, folks who we know well have told us, if the White House wants to restrain attacks on leadership and NBC in a Korean scenario, they better get that information to us really quickly in, in the first hours of a conflict because otherwise it might be tough to put that genie back in the bottle. All right, last slide, conclusion. All right, so what does all this mean? So first of all, and this is the, the most important thing, the most important thing, nothing, nothing else matters in, the, in this one, which is the conventional wisdom in Washington is, is nuclear weapons are a relic. Nuclear, intentional nuclear use isn't gonna happen. There are no rational reasons to use nuclear weapons, let alone against the United States, for God's sake. We have the most powerful nuclear weapons on the planet, most powerful nuclear forces. But this is wrong which is adversaries do have major incentives to escalate for the same reason we intended to do it when we were gonna get overrun in this war in, in Western Europe. And so rather than be shocked, what were they thinking? How did this happen? I guess the North Koreans were crazy. We would serve ourselves and our allies well to understand what their incentives are now and, and how we might be making those more or less likely. Number two is, is um, the intermediate or the immediate political and military challenges is Number one is to make sure that conventional war planners are focused on this danger, um, to try to get civilian leadership in Washington to understand better what these dynamics might be, and also to make sure that as we cut the arsenal, that again, rather than being a numbers game, what's the right number, 880, 762, 550, that really should be a capabilities discussion. What are the capabilities remaining in the US arsenal and in the complementary conventional forces that would be most useful to us in this scenario, both from the standpoint of deterring escalation by the adversary and pr protecting, protecting allies and ourselves if it happens. And finally, there's the big challenge for the analytic community. And this is where I feel totally sheepish and Kier does too as well. We had, you know, a very well-meaning major out in US PACOM said, so what, have you, what do you guys know? What does your field produce? You've studied nuclear deterrence for 60 years, 70 years, not us, but our field. So what kind of targets would we want to hit to prevent escalation? The answer is we don't have good analytic concepts about how you wage conventional war without causing escalation, with the reason being in the conventional, in the, in the Cold War, that wasn't our task. NATO's task was to escalate. It's only now that we're trying to fight conventional war without escalation. Um, and finally, is try to communicate these deterrence challenges to the public so they don't think about the nuclear arsenal and nuclear modernization and nuclear forces merely as holdovers from a different era, but they understand the key role that it still places in US and allied national security problems. So with that, let's, let's end and just take as many questions as you guys have. Thank you, that was quite thought provoking. Uh, so there's no roving mic, so you need to speak up. Questions? In the front. Uh, let me go to scenario number four that you laid out. And uh, I wanna tease it out a little more. Rather than worry about escalation control, I want to design a conventional counterforce campaign that preemptively destroys the nukes. This is more applicable to the Pakistan, North Korea, maybe Iran scenario than the Russian scenario, obviously. When I go through your capabilities, you had, there was always one no in those boxes, but the air delivered options relied on promptness. You said it's not prompt. I'm not sure that it has to be prompt, but you need tactical surprise, which you could get with air-delivered weapons. So my question is, why couldn't a conventional war planner rely on tactical surprise, conventional counterforce to destroy preemptively those nuclear weapons, and then you have missile defense in three of those options to mop up, or air defense and missile defense, to mop up the so-called ragged retaliatory strike. Why isn't that a perfectly reasonable, coherent, and possibly doable conventional strategy? Yeah. Do you want to, uh, um, remember, we also have the, I'm probably going to back up the um, conventional comparison slide. Why don't you take um, so, so the question of kind of um, why is promptness um, so important? I guess, um, let, me, let me think about it two ways. 
So um, when, when we're talking about promptness, we're talking about time from, and can you hear me by the way? Can people in the back hear me? Yes. We're talking about, um, about time from target identification to arrival of weapon system. So I think you're right that in a situation in which either, one of two situations, so a, a pre-war situation in which, in which we're initiating the, the conventional or nuclear disarming strike for the purpose, because we see where this is going, then it reduces the importance of promptness because we're acting first. You know, the time, so I think that's right. You could do it from, you could do it from Missouri, from Whiteman Air Force Base, if, if there's no ticking clock because you're going first. I think the promptness gets more important if you're in a, situ in, in a conflict situation where the adversary has employed them. And especially, let me, let me kind of, in employed real time. Nuclear weapons? Say it again. Or so the adversary has employed nuclear The adversary has employed nuclear weapons, although let me kind of say it differently, I'm, I'm sorry, um, is, um, whether actually whether we've gone first or the adversary has gone first in terms of employing nuclear weapons, I, I think the, still the key thing is the length of time between sensor and munition. And to some extent, you can, you can massage that if you can keep giving sensor updates to either the bomber crew in the air or even in, with different weapons to the munition in the air, then the long flight time from Missouri might not matter so much. Well, the shortest link from sensor to weapon application would be if the aircraft has its own sensor platform. Sure, you that's right. You can't get faster than that. Yeah. So if you're doing search and destroy or, yeah. you know, the old mobile target hunting missions, yeah. I'm not saying they necessarily work today, but conceptually at least, um, that could be an effective option. Yeah, let me just put the slide back up here. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm, maybe I'm not quite getting your question in a sense. So with this, um, we're not at all making the case against the, the existing bomber or, or DCA's dual capable <coughs> aircraft. Um, and in fact, kind of one of, you know, where Kier and I started talking about, started working on, I'm going to sit down next year. When we started working on force structure, one of the big arguments we were making is we were saying this is a strong, strong argument for the modernization of the B-61 for the you know, in, uh, reported in, um, improved accuracy of the B-61. And the B-61, especially on aircraft which were deployed toward the theater, could, could probably be the best you could do toward many of these objectives we've just talked about. But our understanding is there are all kinds of constraints in terms of, of, of employing this. So again, without going into classified, we, don't, um, we can't go too far on this, but my understanding is, is is unless you have storage vaults on the Korean Peninsula for the dual capable aircraft, you might be highly reluctant to move nuclear, one might be highly reluctant to move nuclear weapons on F-16s to the Korean Peninsula if there's a conflict. Um, even from Guam, you know, have to take the distance and divide by 520 mi miles an hour or something like this, but it's multiple hours from, from decision to employ them until they arrive if you're going for dual capable aircraft. But we didn't mean to imply that the dual capable aircraft don't have a role to play, far from it, if you look at the current arsenal and just open source discussions about yield options, the only thing in the U.S. arsenal which has the accuracy and the yield to do this sort of thing is the current air-delivered weapons. But am I, so am I missing? Let me, let me, yeah, let me just, so just I want to stay out of the nuclear business. Yeah. I want to use B-61s. Oh, uh, I want to use uh, F-35 out it. of South Korea yep. with some forward-looking infrared. And right. because in the North Korean scenario, if you think ten oh eights and no dongs and things like that. They're mobile missiles yep. where its uh, target location is the key, not yield or anything like that. If you can find it, you can destroy it with conventional warheads. You don't need a nuke. If you can't find it, you probably need your W-88 to start doing some area barrages. Yeah. So the key is finding it. Yep. Once you find it, uh, you can destroy it quickly. And the best platform I could think of is F-35 with that sensor on it. Maybe B fifty uh, B two with uh, some radar or something like that on it, and you do uh, scud hunting. Just to, but this time you'd want it to be effective. That's the big question. Yeah, just a couple of points of clarification. I mean, number one, if it's an issue about you know we focused on <clears throat> the implications for the nuclear force structure, and part of what I take from your question is well, you know if we know this is a problem. You know, why don't we conventionally preempt, um, and then some of these issues, you know, about promptness aren't aren't as much of a concern because you're operating from strategic surprise, et cetera. Um, first of all, we are not opposed to conventional counterforce. I mean, in fact, we're you know, it'd be harder to find two people who support that as well. So this is not an issue of nuclear versus conventional in terms of where we should be thinking about counterforce. 
the second point I make is that there's no doubt that people are thinking about this, um, that, that there are analysts who look at this scenario, maybe for the reasons we say, see no way out of nuclear, n North Korean nuclear escalation if war comes. If you know that, then on our minute one, you want to go after everything with everything you've got. Now, obviously, you'd like to do that without nuclears if you can, and I, we, we could add cyber to this, and we could add all sorts of other things. So people are, you know, kind of thinking about this. I just, the, the last thing I'll say is that, number one, there might be obvious political reasons not to preempt. Okay, again, maybe you're going into this conflict expecting to keep it limited somehow, and by preempting with con a conventional attack on your adversary's nuclear forces, that's fairly escalatory. And the second thing is, and this might lead to a bigger discussion, which I'm not sure we want to get into you know, right now, right here, although maybe willing if you push it, um, there are some things that conventional maybe can't do when it comes to going after nuclear forces. And so you may need nuclear no matter how you look at it. There may be some things cyber can't do, uh, and then conventional as well. Just one second. I apologize, Dean. I, mis I totally misunderstood your question. I'm, I'm tired. But uh, you were asking the conventional question. Just to add, give one little hint on what Kier just said is, is the, the, the quick answer people give often is, is, why can't you do all this with conventional if you can find the targets? And, and kind of one way of thinking about this is, the ability to do this with conventional forces probably depends on a lot of things related to the context and how the, and how the conflict has unfolded. So if you've already suppressed their air defenses, if you've already suppressed GPS jamming, um, which is going to be key for very accurate delivery of the conventional weapons. Um, if you already have big force packages in the theater, because you're going to be doing simultaneous conventional strikes that are going to have to be escorted in to multiple targets in different locations. And that's, I don't mean to say that, that you can't do those. So in the midst of a big ongoing conventional war, where you've already done the seed campaign and suppressed GPS jammers, you might be in a good position to do such things with conventionally. Earlier in the campaign, where you might not have enough air, air in the theater to do that, where seed hasn't been suppressed, where GPS um, jamming has not been suppressed, your conventional capabilities will be much, much smaller relative to the nuclear. But in terms of kind of the details of that, we could talk, we could talk through. Sorry, I missed your question. Who's next? Just to take that, I mean, uh, Dean, a little bit further. One thing, I, it's not just a question of preemption, because, I mean, you listed conventional counterforces. I mean, you listed that in your, your yep. number four option. So I was kind of expecting to see it included in this table. Yeah. So if you look, you know, longer term and, and add that, would you argue that uh, in terms of capabilities, we are moving in the right direction in terms of uh, conventional counterforce. Do you see that as a viable path for, this is not preemptive, but, yep. but as response to a limited nuclear strike by a you know, limited power like uh, North Korea? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think of the short term, I think is, or not the short term, I think that the short answer is to say, in our judgment, the United States is doing about six things. Actually, we're giving another talk to a different audience here this afternoon, and we have a list of six or seven things the United States is doing to sharpen its counterforce capabilities. And the one that we're doing... Okay. Yeah, that's right. Only the least one is some things relating to nuclear forces. Um, it's you know, kind of traditional conventional strike, prompt global conventional strike. It's missile defense. It's... ISR upgrades to kind of integrate better sensors and shooters. It's it's ASW, it's uh, um, some other stuff, and, and we so we think that this is a approach which is very useful to this. At the end of the day, we see these as complementary capabilities with nuclear, and I guess there's a, there's a couple different reasons. And one of them has to do with all these contextual things, which is conventional because your lethal radius of a conventional 2,000 pound bomb against a hardened shelter your lethal radius is so much smaller than even against a B-61 at 0.3 kilotons. Where a B-61 at 0.3 kilotons, depending on which, what, how you do the math, you might have 10, 20 meters of lethal radius. With the, with the, G, with the GPS guided bomb, you might, have, you might have to basically hit the target. And so given that, you have much less, you need many more weapons on target, you, you're much more sensitive to GPS jamming and these sorts of things. So we still think there's a nuclear role on this. With respect to the target um, finding TELs or mobile launchers, our read of the Scud hunt in 1991 that Dean referred to was that the big problem with the Scud hunt in 91 was not locating a, T, a, a mobile launcher. It was basically, it was the growing target location uncertainty that grows exponentially with time since last observation. And it was the, that growing target location uncertainty between sensor and shooter. And if you're using a cluster munition or something like that, you just have a much smaller lethal radius than if you're using a low yield nuclear weapon against a soft target. And so you still do, we did some, some modeling we could show you, you or you've done or maybe yourself, about what is the differential value 
of using low yield nuclear against even mobile targets rather than than area conventional. And there still is a gap between those two. <coughs> I mean, <laughs> well, he went to he went to Saudi, didn't he? Yeah. Did you yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems the most viable yeah. option, but it just seems relatively impossible to get them to do it. There, uh, and there's no no question. This is not a very viable and you know, appealing option. I mean, we can't. You know, whether or not the extent to which we're ta speaking with the Chinese about this possibility for North Korea before a conflict. I mean. You know, I hope so, but I wouldn't bet. I wouldn't bet Daryl's car car on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so given given what where you've gone with this in your discussions with USFK and USFJ and with PACOM, you, I know, understand you also had discussions with the allies. So, what are, what are their feelings? Because they have to have confidence in the U.S. deterrent at the end of the day, and so. Did you, did you talk about this with them in terms of capabilities and what, are, what is their belief in the, in the power of the U.S. deterrent to be able to protect them? It's, it's a great question. I, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm hesitant to respond in, in one sense, which is that it seems like you can find um, um, any ally that you want. You know, like I have my Japanese friends who tell me they were nervous about the retirement of the TLAMN. Okay, but James Acton or Perkovich or you know these arm controller folks say they have their out Japanese allied friends who say that's ridiculous. We don't you know our faith in the U.S. you know alliance doesn't depend on the nu the actual nuclear capabilities. So I mean they're wrong. I'm right, but the point is <laughs> the point is this um, and uh, you know again we. Um, both Japanese and, uh, well, actually in Europe too, but Japanese and, and, and South Koreans analysts have seen this, both policymakers and, and, and not. And, you know, again, I just go, I, I'm ambivalent. I, I'm not sure how to respond because on the one hand, there is nervousness, okay, about, uh, first of all, they're just coming to the term, terms with the idea that this could escalate to the nuclear level. I think in some ways, particularly South Korean allies, think that American nuclear capabilities just deter, you know, take off the table an adversary nuclear escalation. They think, often our allies think we can do a lot more than we actually can do. So they have this great faith in it. And yet they, again, gen grossly generalizing, tend not to understand that their actions are going to help precipitate reactions that we may not be able to deal with. So if anybody seems to be less restrained, I would say some of our, uh, again, I have South Korean friends who want to go to Pyongyang at the next, the next war, maybe don't understand these escalation dynamics. But on the other hand, that everyone's a realist uh, in these stages of these days, and um, you know I think people are quite concerned. We do have a mic now. <laughs> so, so a couple of things that were surprising. One is that in terms of conventional war fighting, that if a nuke is used or goes nuclear, that you're still going to be fighting this conventional war. That people would think that it's not their problem. I mean, this is one of the problems we see with war games is it goes nuclear and the game's over. Well, in all these scenarios now, most of the time, it wasn't over. You're still prosecuting conventional war. The other issue with the, the scenario is, is a leadership survival scenario possible after we've had a nuke on Kadena? So how many U.S. service members have died? Is that really, or if you hit a South Korean city, I mean, is that really a rational possibility? You mean to do in response to that, do anything short of turn Pyongyang into glass, kind of an issue? Or, or number four. Yeah, or launch number four. Um, well, I don't know if you have any response. I'll just quickly re respond, which is first of all, okay, let's do a different scenario where they detonate one over the sea, you know, of the EC. The point is, there is an escalation ladder, and if you tell me that's going too far, that would trigger a response where we're not no other options are possible, then we might just back it up and say, okay, well, what about this escalatory step? And reasonable people can disagree about where the red line is. You know, it's, it's, difficult, um, uh, it's difficult to say in advance, you know, where exactly the red line is. And some people, you know, say it's lights out if they've used any nuclear device in any kind of way. Um, 
after nuclear use, why not their problem? Are you referring to the comments from the conventional war planners saying, well, that's mainly like the, the, to demonstrate the stovepiping of how we think about, you know, uh, the conventional side and the nuclear side. And their point is, look, if you, did you say the word nuclear? Well, this is, why aren't you talking to STRATCOM? But they're still going to be asked to maintain their They're still, well, that's what they care about. They care about, well, what, maybe what it will be like to operate in a nuclear environment. Um, but again, the kind of reflection that we're looking for, and it would be, it would be wrong to say that it's not there at all, but is how did my, how did our actions, which were, f f you know, carrying out the civilians, you know, directive to win the conflict, how did those actions precipitate actions that we didn't want to happen? And there's where we're not seeing a whole lot of, um, uh, a deep appreciation. Again, I, we our instincts are to blame the civilians, you know, um, uh, even before the military commanders. When we go to Washington and we brief in the Pentagon, and we have you know DASD level um, folks saying, "Don't worry, don't worry, guys, we got this. You know, we have options. And if a conflict on the Korean Peninsula breaks out, you know, we've got categories. We can't speak openly about what we have in mind here, but we have options. And then you go out and you talk to military commanders or other military folks in the Pentagon who kind of look at you cockeyed and say, well, okay, you better tell us in the first hours what exactly you want us to withhold for this purpose. And you got to wonder, there's still, you know, massive kind of disconnect between uh, um, who's responsible for, for what here. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if that's no. a full response. Yeah, just to build on that in two different ways. So, so um, I might maybe I was not clear when I said this the first time. When we when we heard or when we hear the this is not our problem response from conventional war planners, what they're saying is it's they as they often see it. Again, I think with with China scenarios, air sea battle scenarios in China being a little different. But in general, the attitude is we fight the conventional fight. The president has somebody else for deterrence for nuclear deterrence, and certainly for nuclear employment if it gets to that. And so they say, we're not, we're not nuclear command. You got on the wrong plane. You shouldn't be out here. And the whole point of what we're trying to say, and again, we witnessed, we did not take part in, we witnessed a pretty nasty shouting fight in one of these meetings between folks from the joint staff and folks from the regional command who basically said, right, we have somebody else who deals with nuclear employment if it comes to that, but it is your job, regional command, to conduct conventional operations in a way to minimize the odds of escalation. And in fact, that's in the, what's the name, the, the guidance on the employment of forces. And so the not my job comment was often about we fight to win the conventional fight, nukes is something else. And what we're trying to say and others are trying to say is yes, but the way you do your job will affect whether it goes this bad, this bad way. On the, the, the question you raised about, about response options, um, I, I guess I'd just come back to this, this slide, I and mean, I don't see any way out of this, which is there is the reaction that basically says that, God, if somebody does this, if somebody uses a nuclear weapon against Kadena, there is no way we can do anything other than we can't possibly leave that regime in power. It's over. That, that discussion, anyone who makes that argument is going to be out of the Oval Office. But I do think that will be an initial angry, emotional response. But unless somebody in the room has a good story on number four, conventional only, conventional and nuclear, unless you tell me how the employment of US military forces after that actually saves that dozen Japanese or South Korean cities, then we're gonna have to find some politically acceptable way to do number one. And maybe that politically acceptable way is you attack some, you, you nuke some small South, uh, North Korean city just to have retaliated and then you have some UN official say, you know, the Secretary General plead for peace and whatever. But that's just a version of number one. You accept the ceasefire. But you'd hate to do number one. You'd hate to leave the regime in power. It would be every instinct not to do that. But that hinges on you being able to protect yourself, presumably, and your forces, as somebody said in the, in the, path, in the back. China was a big player. And it's entirely possible, for example, that as soon as things really got hot, China would step in and say, you know, this really is part of our sphere of influence, and we would be forced to go to number one. 
Yeah, so we might, so you're saying we might have to choose number one for a different reason, for kind of um, having to do with kind of risks of broader nuclear escalation with China. I'd like to, I'd like to yeah. develop this scenario yeah. more with some other big regional players yeah. in the region besides yeah. just one player, the, us, and then a little bit. Yeah, there, there's, there's no question that, um, you know, the lack of the third party dimension to this, other than a kind of casual reference to a possible golden parachute, is, is not sufficient. It's sufficient for kind of laying out the dynamics of the escalation problem. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, since we're, we're tenured professors, we can you know, venture to say things uh, before we've really thought about them without suffering, con <laughs> suffering consequences. Uh, the only thing I'll just quickly respond to is the idea that, you know, China could step in and say, no, you're going to choose option number one because of our threats to, again, you'd have to, what, what are the threats that they would actually make to f compel us to do number one, are they going to make nuclear threats? I mean, it's it's hard for me to imagine that at that moment China is going to have a lot of leverage over our actions after we've been nuked in a Kadena. Our boys have died, or our, they're at sea and they've died, and China is not going to dictate to us what we're going to do. I mean, you talk about politics for a president. This is like this, you know, this is regime change, self-inflicted regime change. Um, so I kind of see, you know, put yourself in China's shoes, not clear what kind of leverage they would have. I actually thought you were going to ask a question about what if we did a scenario, you know, over the Taiwan Straits and, a, 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 you know, fighting an amphibious invasion of Taiwan by China and the escalatory dynamics there, in which case Daryl was going to take the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think another key answer, and I think this is actually super important, is, is we've got to keep in mind what is the purpose of the scenario in this. Please don't take from this that we're trying to explain to you what would happen in a Korean war, a war on the Korean Peninsula. I know enough about war, Kira knows enough about war to know that we can't predict that. We can't, you can't, nobody can. That's not the purpose of the scenario. The purpose of the scenario is to make what, what is actually, again, in the current climate of thinking about nuclear weapons, I think a rather bold and unusual claim, which is to say, our prosecution of conventional war either because of the end states we seek or the manner with which we fight or the fragility of the enemy creates logical and rational incentives to escalate. If you wanna, if you wanna understand how do we think a North Korean war would play out, I think the best we could do is get a bunch of the best North Korea experts, if there are any in the US, meaning just because they're so hard to understand, in the US government and war game it out 50 or 100 times and see the variations, et cetera, and bring China in and I think I'd be with you. You'd want China to be an active player in this. But that's not our objective here. And, and so our objective is to say that those of us who are thinking about deterrence and those of us who are thinking about U.S. force structure requirements, conventional and nuclear, need to have the strategic empathy of the adversary situation. And we need to understand that our way of fighting in the end states we seek force even reasonable adversaries to reach for the nuclear trigger. And we might actually be facing people who are not always reasonable. That's, that's the limited purpose of the scenario, and that's why I think it's okay we left out China. We're not trying to predict what would happen in this. I uh, tend to agree with you that uh, if there's any lack in what we uh, have prepared for, that it originates in the civilian sector. And you started off by saying uh, that in Washington, D.C., characterizing it as broadly uh, not recognizing that there's a legitimate interest by countries that aren't as strong to, in fact, develop some uh, something along the lines that we ourselves did, as you say, in the uh, uh, early Cold War, that the Indians specifically stated in the 70s that more recently, when uh, challenged to uh, reduce the stockpile, the Russian president basically stated, and, and others, uh, is, is there any way of uh, challenging this inherited knowledge that you talk about in Washington uh, other than wait for funerals? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm tempted to give a good news, you know, again, because we, we're such bearers of bad news. Um, you know, the, the inherited wisdom, as you're right, those of us with, you know, gray hair and graying hair, uh, who cut our teeth on nuclear deterrence, kind of find, and at the end of the Cold War, just find it so hard to come back to traditional issues of interstate deterrence. Um, but the good news is that there is a younger generation of you know, students. Again, we have a lot of contact with students, and we teach them about nuclear weapons, and they don't, they're not starting with those 
so-called truce of the nuclear age and all these other ideas that nuclear weapons are relevant, they buy, you know, we don't have to convince them, uh, especially if we give this presentation, that nuclear weapons are a problem. Um, and so there's hope, that, you know, that uh, 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 for uh, future generations. The problem, of course, is that, you know, policymakers are making decisions today in, on Capitol Hill and, so and, and in Washington. Well, um, yeah, this is a, this is, again, I, I feel um, odd speaking to you all about this issue about, you know, is nuclear modernization, you know, when I hear arm, arms control folks say, you know, uh, bashing the Obama administration and saying, look, they're proceeding fully with modernization and, you know, they've broken all their commitments and, uh, uh, on, and then, you know, on one hand and on the other hand, you know, anybody kind of knows anything about where we are in terms of nuclear modernization is, you know, good reason to worry and, and all the rest. Um, it's hard to, as Daryl said, read the tea leaves and say where things are headed or that, you know, certain people need to move off, uh, off the scene. I think to the extent to which we begin to talk about nuclear weapons as if they really do matter, right, the better. And the reality is we may say that nuclear weapons don't matter. I mean, we don't say it here, but public rhetoric is that nuclear weapons don't matter. If you want them, you're evil. Let's get rid of them, global disarmament, et cetera. The reality is even if we believed that stuff, our adversaries, as Daryl said, think differently. And if they think differently, if they care about nukes, then we need to care about nukes. It's like nukes, you may not care about nukes, but they care about you. If our adversaries care about nukes, then they're our business. And particularly when it comes to you know, thinking about nuclear counterforce and the realities of the modern era of counterforce, which is kind of a topic for another time, then we need to get serious quickly. But it may not be as um, desperate as hoping, you know, individuals pass from the scene that, with bad ideas. Let me, let me kind of add to that one second, which is here we should just all point the fingers at ourselves. I mean, I mean seriously, um, in, a, in a positive sense, which is this, the problem that, that we're talking about now about, about kind of misperception and misunderstanding among the public, among Congress who funds these things, ultimately that's, that's for us to fix by talking openly and candidly. And, and the, the problem is, as you guys know, the number of people who have understanding of these issues is smaller. And the percentage of those people who are working on a day-to-day -day with TS or higher material is going up. And so the folks who understand these things increasingly can't talk about them publicly. But at the end of the day is, is in the 1980s, there was a vigorous, detailed debate in the United States about the wisdom and lack of wisdom of various aspects of nuclear modernization. Was the peacekeeper a, life, a, deterrence, a force for deterrence? Or was it a, a creating instability in a first, you know, et cetera? And, and we had a public national debate where people took sides about how to success, what a good deterrent looks like force and how, how to do this. Nowadays, when our leadership, and I don't just mean the elected leadership, I mean military leadership, think tank leadership, maybe labs leadership, though I haven't been following. When we talk publicly about the roles and missions of the nuclear force, we now publicly talk about it in very general terms. We talk about the signaling power of weapons, we talk about the importance of deterrence, but you don't have a public debate that's anywhere as detailed as when people were talking about the counterforce capabilities of the MX versus the instability co consequences of the, of the peacekeeper, excuse me. And so I guess what I'm saying is, and Kier and I are saying is, without going into classified and without arguing against national policy, which is a reduction of, currently it's a reduction of the role of nuclear weapons and uh, working toward a world of zero. Within that construct, you can talk about how various capabilities in the arsenal either further or don't further US national objectives. And it might be politically uncomfortable for people in leadership positions to talk about that because it's become verboten. But we can do it without going into classified. And ultimately, if, if, if people, if, if some of you, if all of you, if most of you agree that this is an important mission, it ultimately falls upon us to, to, to talk publicly about why, in terms of actual capabilities, why certain conventional capabilities are really important for the conventional counterforce role, why counterforce is important for the alliance network, why these capabilities would be really valuable and useful for protecting us and our forces and our allies if war came to us. But we just, ultimately, we just have to be willing to talk openly and honestly about national policy. And I think you can. I think our national policy is defensible about we don't want to use nuclear weapons, but we might be forced to. So let's talk about what that means. Wait for the microphone. So sort of as an opposite poll in terms of a representative example, have you developed a Russia scenario? Kier talked about the Russians. No. <laughs> 
No. Uh, no. No, we have not. It's been years. Because I would argue that uh, as an explicit policy, they have nuclear de escalation. There's great uncertainty about what kind of target sense would actually be targeted by yes. the weapons. But the likely res what their perceptions of a response would be. So I would argue that and you're dealing with a different situation because the class of Cold War end state still exists there. The North Koreans, at least, totally developed by some can't threaten their national survival. And something happens with the Russians and it goes, something goes wrong. You're in a really deep hurt, you're back to the worst case. And yet they adopted a policy, sort of like folding gap, without the automatic it's going to lead to a lot of isolation. Yeah. I really think that, you know, scenarios and responses like that, if somebody, somebody needs to be thinking about this in a way that can be discussed in you. Uh, just very quick, I'll say that we used to say when we give our list of, you know, what countries think this way and what's the evidence, you know, it's easy to point to Pakistan. You know, this is official nuclear doctrine is coercive escalate, nuclear escalation. Uh, and uh, for Russia, we used to say, you know, at least rhetorically, they would argue their need to retain tactical nuclear capabilities was necessary, you know, vis-a-vis -vis NATO conventional power. And so obviously we're not going to make an arms control agreement to cut tactical nuclear weapons. We need this. Um, and then after saying that a few times, there, you know, um, uh, I was going to say uh, Soviet experts, Russian experts, now, you know, tell us, no, it's, you know, you don't need to say it rhetorically. I mean, that is actually the way they're thinking about nuclear use and nuclear weapons. Um, you know, so it's even a better, you know, example of it than, than, um, than we've suggested. And I think maybe one, I'll take the opportunity to make one broader point, which is that, you know, this danger of coercive nuclear escalation applies. Uh, not, it's not just a U.S problem. I mean, the U.S. is, that's on our mind, and, you know, because we have these extensive alliance commitments and because our conventional power is so strong, it's important for us to understand this problem. But for India and Pakistan, that dyad of countries faces similar dynamics. It's just a different world from the Cold War where the nuclear powers were armed to the teeth and it was, uh, it might have been difficult to um, uh, think about it in the same way. Um, these dynamics, you know, apply in many different places, potentially. And uh, I'm sure you started the nuclear posture review, and, and so the question I have is, how did you see it as addressing or not addressing your issues, and where would you want to see it uh, either modified or, or emphasized in the uh, public debate? So I, I think, do you want me to start with this? Yeah, so let me start with the general. I think, I think the public debate, the public discussion, um, at the broadest level um, should be modified in the following way, which is we can, we can say the truthful statements, I think they're truthful, that the United States wishes as a national policy, wishes that nuclear weapons never be used again, number one, and number two is that we are working to reduce their role in US national security strategy. We should say those things, I think they're truthful. Then we should say as we, uh, that it is still the United States policy to uh, you know, have the threat of nuclear use and the actuality if necessary as a way of deterring nuclear strikes in the United States and its allies and responding if necessary. We can get that far. Then we should say the third set, which is we should say, to that end, we, the United States, should be asking ourselves what sorts of capabilities in the conventional and nuclear arsenal would actually be most useful to us and our allies if we had to use them, with the notion that those are the exact capabilities that would be most useful for the purpose of deterring employment by the adversary, and for reducing the consequences to us and our allies if we got to there. It's that third part which is utterly and completely missing from our public discussion of nuclear weapons. And, and it's just, it's, again, it doesn't contradict national policy, it just reflects kind of a squeamishness to actually say deterrence is bolstered if you have actual capabilities, whether they're conventional or nuclear, to respond if, it's, if deterrence fails. And furthermore, secondarily, you're better off if you have better capabilities once deterrence fails. And then linking modernization debates. So if there's a, there's a public debate about whether we should spend the money to modernize the B-61, we should be talking about what are the circumstances, whether it's in Russia and Estonia and Latvia, or whether what are the circumstances in which that could plausibly be useful to have that weapon versus a different weapon. And when people are talking about what exactly should go into the, into the, into the requirements for the follow-on to Trident II, and whether it's important to have a flexible yield option, and whether it's important to spend the money to try to get the, have the CEP again, 
that people should be willing to talk about, well, are there circumstances under which it would be important to have those capabilities? So I think that's how, we'd, that's how we try to fix the debate, which is just saying, yeah, we don't want nuclear war, we don't want nuclear weapons to be used, but the deterrent threat that we have, that we continue to have, rests upon certain capabilities that's keep our eye on the prize. In, in terms of the NPR really quickly, I'd just say that, that the parts of the NPR that I think make sense are the parts that have to do with increasing non-nuclear capabilities for all these missions. I think that makes sense. I also just think that we need now, after a, a two, three decade holiday, on work on, on substantial modernization of U.S. nuclear delivery systems. We just have to, the, the place I'd add to the NPR is kind of more emphasis on, more emphasis on ensuring that we have the right nuclear forces as well for these missions to complement the conventional. Without a prohibition on new nuclear capabilities that we somehow, an insidious prohibition on these, it's nonsense. I don't know where it came from and uh, we need to reverse that no matter what. Seems to right. be a thought that if we don't develop it, no one else will. Right. So we have time for a few more questions, and we get the first one out. In your uh, talking with the American military, particularly those with nuclear authority, did you run into any uh, Curtis LeMays, people who might take your option four and say, you bet, we're going to strike heavy, fast, and that'll be the end of it? Are there no Curtis LeMays talking in the Oval mm -hmm. Office or on Capitol Hill? Which Curtis LeMay, the, the George Wallace one, the running mate, or the uh, earlier, the, the man who, you know, basically helped us win World War II? Um, I, I get your... I'll give you a Curtis LeMay quote just so there's no difficulty understanding. When he was pushing for yet even more bombers, when we had overwhelming destruction in the Soviet Union, they asked the general, why do you want more bombers, more bombs? And he said, quote, I want to see the cinders bounce. Now, do you run into that kind of mentality? I, I, I think my answer is going to be the same as Daryl's. I'm going to let him respond more seriously, but some, uh, um, you know, making jokes. Uh, uh, I, I think my answer is no. We don't run into many of those folks at all. But my favorite Curtis LeMay um, line was when uh, um, he's being briefed with the president and uh, uh, other cabinet officers on the capabilities of the new ICBM missiles, and he, and he asks about warhead yield, and they tell him the warhead yield. He says, uh, well, as, uh, as soon as you can put something bigger than an effing firecracker on the tip of that thing, call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, two, two very quick answers. So number one, it's my experience, I think Kier's as well, that any time you talk to somebody wearing a uniform, any time I've talked to it, whether we're talking about pilots, B-52s, or whether we're talking about people with command responsibility, everybody talks about them in a very appropriately cautious, reverential, restrained sort of fashion. Um, you know, as befitting basically a national policy which, in which we view these as the weapons of last, last, last employment choice. Um, and so I've not run into anybody who's talked... Um, who's talked kind of lightly about use of nuclear weapons. But here's the, the, important, the important part of my answer. The important part of my answer is, because of our Cold War baggage, uh, mine, I'm alleging yours, all, most of ours, in which after, I don't know, by the early 1980s, I mean, large-scale nuclear war was going to be an utter complete catastrophe in one flavor or another for all of us. Um, that we, we tend to associate the counterforce position, the capabilities or the employment, as being kind of craziness in some fashion. And let me just kind of bring us back to where we were 10 minutes ago, which is <coughs> if adversary escalation to avoid the fate of Saddam doesn't want to be hung, doesn't want to have his sons killed, if that's not crazy in the course of a war, then 10 minutes ago, kind of the sentiment I was getting from some of you guys, and I think it's very reasonable, was after, after you get adversary employment, of course we're not going to do number one. You couldn't remain president of the United States. So that means you're saying the only rational position is going to be some form of number four. Now, I think that's overstated because I think four could be lousy enough as an option in some circumstances that you'll end up with a version of number one. But I just want to kind of be real clear, at least in my view, that the argument that says for the carrying out of the commitments we've made to our allies and the protection of them and the protection to U.S. forward forces and soon the American homeland, saying that you need counterforce capabilities, number four, to me it's pretty far away from kind of like the crazier part of Curtis LeMay. That in a way, that that's, ought to be the mainstream view of any of you who think a president would have a hard time doing number one. Otherwise, we're just lying to the Japanese and South Koreans. Last question. Uh, 
I guess my question is more so uh, back to the, the China relationship with North Korea and, and North Korea, the, the whole relationship there. Uh, what if, or if it's even possible, I don't know if it is, if we start a conventional war with North Korea and we do start pushing forward, uh, no nuclear weapon is, is fired, but China comes over and just like the Korean War, pushes us back to almost off the peninsula itself. Um, what then? Do we do we just stop and use number one? Probably, I guess. Or do we? I guess how how likely is that situation? I, I don't have a good response to that. I mean, just you know, we can play out all these different scenarios. It, it gets away from the logic that we're looking at, which is about logic of nuclear escalation. I mean, again, my quick reaction is that that seems highly implausible that China is going to push us off the Korean Peninsula in a conventional war. Again, I, I, I could imagine them moving into, you know, forces into the north and uh, us deciding not to continue marching on Pyongyang, which is, which is number one, um, or bringing the war to a halt as, you know, as quickly as possible via Chinese actions that we kind of agree to. Um, but it's not, it's not our area of expertise. It's not, um, not something that, you know, can venture a, I would venture a prediction of. Yeah, I would only add to say, is my understanding, someone correct me if I'm wrong, that the most current NPR, um, again, maybe didn't take it off in a black letter sort of way, but stepped back considerably from the U.S. employment of nuclear weapons to compensate for conventional military defeat. I think, I think there was a substantial stepping back from that when it was, there was, there was text about kind of the, the circumstances and the roles for the U.S. nuclear arsenal. I think that was eliminated. Now, there's some blanket language that basically says, but we'll use them to advance the vital national interest, whatever. But I think we've taken steps back from kind of envisioning employment, we, the United States government, from envisioning the employment of U.S. nuclear weapons as a way of, of dealing with conventional defeat. But again, when bad things are happening and U.S. forces are losing, if a, you know, then, then a president could always decide what he wants to decide. But, but to kind of take a step back again, when, when if, you know, we talk to people, staff members at, at the House, we talk to staff members at the Senate, when their bosses are thinking about bills to fund modernization of the nuclear arsenal, the level of, of kind of engagement is on the level of, well, who's going to nuke the United States? Maybe they like it because of their district. Maybe they don't. Maybe they're strong on defense or they don't view themselves as such. But they're not thinking about kind of actual employment of use, nuclear weapons because nobody's talking to them about that. And if there's one thing I, that, I, that I think as a message, it, it's important to kind of get out there over and over and over and over and over again, I guess it's two, both from Kier's half of the presentation. Number one, our regional wars are their total wars. And we seem to have think that the big change with the end of the Cold War is it moved from total war to regional war. No, that's from our perspective, not from the dog's perspective. Our regional wars are their total wars. And number two, is people tend to believe that, well, there's no rational incentive to use nuclear weapons. And the answer is, when we were going to lose, that was our plan. So maybe adversaries are kinder than us. Maybe they're more risk averse than us. Maybe they care more about humanitarianism than us. But when we face the situation that they face today, not just the United States, but the United States and West Germany and France and Belgium and the UK, they all decided that they were going to employ nuclear weapons rather than be overrun by, by the Russians. And so if our plans are based on the assumption that adversaries won't think that, we better ask ourselves what's the basis of that assumption. Great. Thank you all for your time. This has been a most interesting discussion.